It's a gorgeous day outside, no sign of any uh, impending weather. So we're going to um, we're going to talk about hurricanes, but it's going to stay a beautiful sunny day today. All right, I think it looks like everyone is signing in. That's wonderful. I think we're just about ready. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce our special guest today. Uh, my name is Brandy. I'm a bookseller in the children and teens department of politics and prose. Um, and thank you for continuing to tune in to our virtual events where we continue to bring authors and new books to you in the comfort of your own home, or in some cases for maybe some of our guests today in your school. Today we have author illustrator John Rocco and he will discuss his new picture book, Hurricane. John Rocco is a New York Times selling New York Times bestselling author and illustrated illustrator of many acclaimed books for children, including Wolf Wolf, winner of the Borders Original Voices Award for Best Picture Book, Moon Powder, Blizzard, and Blackout, a winner of the Caldecott Honor. Rocco also illustrated Whoopi Goldberg's Alice and the covers for Rick Riordan's inter internationally best-selling series, Percy Jackson and the Olympians, among others. Most recently, Rocco's first book of nonfiction, How We Got to the Moon, was longlisted for a National Book Award. For today's event, you can ask the author a question by clicking on the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. You can also vote on your favorite questions by clicking on the thumbs up button and it'll push your question up, uh, the question that you uh, want to hear answered. And teachers, if you have um, a student who would like to ask a question, just make sure you include the student's name, age, and grade with their question. And just make sure your questions stay on topic. You can also click on the chat to pre-order. Um, I'm sorry, no need to pre-order, it's already out. You can click on the chat to order your own copy of Hurricane. Um, and please note that closed captioning is available for today's program. Just click live transcript button at the bottom of your screen and select enable transcript. All right, with all of that, I'm gonna turn this ship over to John. John, take it away. Thank you so much, Brandy, and thank you to Politics and Prose for hosting me this morning. Um, I'm happy to be here. I'm coming to you from my studio in Rhode Island. Um, and I recently moved back here about four years ago, um, but it's actually where I grew up. Um, I grew up uh, not too far from here uh, in a town called Barrington. And um, I was raised at a time when, um, well, both my parents worked full time. And so I had a lot of freedom as a kid, a lot of freedom to explore uh, my neighborhood and, and the surrounding areas. Um, and a lot of my stories, that the, the books that I, I create, um, have a tendency to stem from those, uh, time periods, you know, those, those, those moments when I just had that, that time to do these adventures that I would go on. Um, one of my books, Blizzard, is about my experience in a, in a blizzard back in 1978, uh, when I actually ended up tying tennis rackets to my feet to get to the store because we needed supplies. And uh, the snow was so high that you couldn't really walk through it. But I found using tennis rackets as snowshoes, it, it helped me stay on top of the snow. And I was able to get to the store and, and get stuff that uh, both my parents and my family needed, but also for some of my neighbors. Um, so that's, a, you know, based on a true experience that I had in, in my old neighborhood. Another book um, that I did about my childhood in a way is called uh, Super Hero and the Barber of Doom. And uh, when I was a little boy, I, I had a lot of hair. I had a, a big head of hair and I, my mother never made me go to the barber. Um, but this book is actually about uh, this boy's experience going to the barber and feeling like he lost his superpowers. Um, and so anyway, 
uh, that those are the kind of stories that I like to explore. Um, in in my book Blackout, um, I I was exploring the idea of how a family would experience a blackout. Uh, we live now in a time with so many distractions, whether it be our phones, our televisions, video games, um, Zoom calls, uh, and all of that. And and so I, I wanted to explore some of those ideas of, you know, what is today's family experience when all those things are, are gone? And so Blackout really takes a look at that and, and it's focused on a particular family in Brooklyn, New York during a Blackout. Um, but it also talks about the general uh, feelings that we all had during this blackout, this this was based on a blackout that happened in 2003 um, in New York City. So, most recently, uh, as Brandy said, I created my first work of nonfiction called "How We Got to the Moon," um, and this is a book about the engineering behind the Apollo moon missions. And so, anything you ever wanted to know about the uh, the moon missions and how we got there is in this very heavily illustrated book and hopefully it will inspire young engineers and thinkers and uh, anyone who wants to learn more about that incredible thing we did 52 years ago by uh, landing a human being on another celestial body um, so Let's get into my latest book, which is Hurricane. And this is, uh, this is a story that's near and dear to my heart because it's about a place that I loved my entire childhood. And so what I'd like to do is share my screen with you and show you some pictures and then read the book and talk to you a little bit about how I made some of the art in the book. And then I'd love to answer any questions you have about anything. Uh, doesn't matter, I will try to answer it. If I don't know the answer, I will let you know. Um, but please feel free to ask me anything about what I do, how I do it, um, and, uh, and we'll get into that at the end. So I will start by sharing a little slideshow with you. Uh, this is me in 1976. As you can see, I still had a lot of hair then. I think I was about, I wanna say nine years old. Um, and I grew up in the small little state of Rhode Island. So if we really look at Rhode Island, you can see that there is a big bay in the middle of Rhode Island with uh, quite a few islands um, and and this is this is where I spent most of my childhood uh, was was out on that bay because I I ended up working on a commercial shellfishing boat that worked in this bay uh, and if we zoom in closer we can see the town that I grew up in which is called Barrington um, and it's in one of these saltwater tributaries uh, that is the Barrington River if we zoom in a little closer, this is my neighborhood. Actually, no, this is my neighborhood uh, right over here. And this is my dock. Uh, we zoom in a little closer. You can see the road that I grew up on. And my house was right here. And this dock belonged to the entire neighborhood. Um, and I would go and walk down that street. I would leave my house. This is the house I grew up on. I grew up in, I should say, uh, and I would walk down this street and there was this amazing dock. Uh, when I was a kid, it didn't look quite like this. It was rebuilt a couple of times uh, since I was a child. Um, it, was, it was mainly this part of the dock that was there until we had rebuilt it. And then when we did, we added this ramp and this thing called a floating dock Right now it's chained up because it's winter time when I took these photos, 
but normally this dock is floating in the water and it will rise and lower on these pilings when the tide comes in or goes out and the ramp will raise and lower so that it's always resting on the dock. So this, this part of the dock is always right next to the water, which is kind of nice because you can sit on the edge and dangle your feet in the water and it really makes it a, a special kind of dock. So let's get into the book, Hurricane by John Rocco. And that's me. I started off the book with uh, just three little paintings to kind of set the tone. You see the, the hurricane out at sea, and then you see this, you sort of follow this seagull coming from the ocean up the bay and up the river, and then coming right to the dock that I grew up next to. This is my dock. Really, it's the neighborhood's dock. But nobody ever comes here except me. It's very old and splintery, and it's my favorite place in the world. It reaches way out over the river, and from here I can fish or crab or swim or just watch the minnows dart between the rocks. The water that flows underneath my dock comes all the way from the sea. At the end of each day, I walk home past all the other houses in my neighborhood. But today feels different. The air is still, and the sound of hammering echoes down the street. Even my dad is acting strange. There's a hurricane coming. Get inside. At dinner, my parents don't say much. I tell them that the best fishing comes right after a big storm. That night, the wind roars and rumbles like the sound of a thousand waves pounding the shoreline. My window rattles and the whole house shakes. The rain doesn't fall in drops. It, it, it slashes sideways as if shot from a fire hose. I watch the river creep up my street, carrying with it anything that can float. I worry our house might wash away. I shut my eyes tight and try to sleep, imagining what might wash up underneath my dock. The next morning is silent. The wind stopped roaring and my window stopped rattling. I grab my gear and rush outside. I almost don't recognize my neighborhood. It was like a giant angry monster stomped through it. And when I get to my dock, I see that the monster destroyed that too. I ask all my neighbors for help. Sorry, I wish I could. We can't, but end up helping them instead. Everyone needs help. By the end of the day, it starts to look like our neighborhood again but my dock is still wrecked. I know what I have to do. I, I have to rebuild it. I grab all the tools I think I need and get to work. Most of the wood is rotted, but I, I use whatever I can find. And day after day, I continue to work on my dock. Just when I'm, I'm about to give up, help arrives. The whole neighborhood comes down. We put in brand new pilings and bolt new boards between them. We nail down the decking and cover the tops of each piling with fiberglass to keep them from rotting. Finally, we add cleats for boats to tie up to it and a railing to make the new ramp safe. Together, we rebuild my dock. And it becomes our dock. It's my favorite place in the world. And so on the very last page, I've included one of the many notes that I, I would leave to my mother and father in the morning when I head down to the dock. Uh, this one says, to mom and dad, I have gone fishing. 
I will come back with a fish. Love, John. P.S. I hope I will come back with a fish. And uh, a lot of times uh, in books, there's an opportunity to add some more information or some more design or illustration on the end pages of a book. So I wanted to share with you the end pages. The front end pages talk about hurricanes and how they form. Um, and it's sort of a, a scientific look at, at how a hurricane forms out in the ocean. And as uh, many of you might know, we've been having more and more hurricanes lately. And, and part of that is because of the temperature of the ocean water is getting warmer. And warm, the warm ocean is actually the food that a hurricane needs to survive and to grow. Um, what happens is the, the, the uh, thunderstorms start to create uh, as the warm water evaporates into the sky. And these thunderstorms gather and start to slowly rotate around each other. Um, and that has to do with the trade winds and, and different things. But uh, eventually, this thing builds and builds and builds into this giant storm that's twisting its way across the ocean. And when it hits land, it usually it loses its food source, right? So then it starts to uh, dissipate and there's no more warm water below it to feed it. Um, so it loses its strength usually when it hits land. Um, but it can come into land with such force that it can really destroy a lot of things. Um, and on the left-hand side, you'll see the different categories of how we categorize different levels of hurricanes. And in the back end pages, uh, I wanted to explain a little bit more about a dock. I know there's many people in this, in this country and around the world that don't live near a river or a lake or, uh, or the ocean and haven't really experienced uh, docks like I did as a kid. Um, so this sort of explains how, how the dock, or at least the dock that I grew up on, how it was built and, and how it works and how it was put together. Um, so when I'm working on a book, uh, what I like to do is create a lot of sketches, um, try to figure out how I'm going to tell the story. And I work on the book in many thumbnail images. Um, I, the reason we call them thumbnail images is because the drawings are a little bigger than my thumb. And uh, it's mainly to just look at the whole book at once and to see how it's working as a picture book. And the nice thing about doing it this way is I can swap images in and out to see what might be working better. I can rearrange things. And I can look to see, oh, where are there going to be maybe some spreads that have no words at all? Like this spread 1415 has no, no text at all on it. Um, are there spreads that have like 24, 25, uh, lots of little smaller illustrations? Um, and then are there too many of those close together? You know, so this one is obviously. Um, what we call a full page spread. It's one painting that covers the entire uh, two pages of the open book. And then this one has many smaller, what we call spot illustrations. So I wanna make sure that there's a, there's a good balance of artwork um, throughout the book. And the next thing I do once I've kind of figured out the book in sketches is I start to do um, test paintings. You know, what is this book going to look like? What kind of colors am I going to use? This is one of my early test paintings that I did for the book. This is another one, just a smaller little painting uh, that was done in watercolors. And this is one of the final paintings that was in the book. Um, and when I sit down to do a final painting, there's a lot of thought that goes into uh, how I compose things on the page. Uh, I start out with a sketch uh, like this one. And 
I start to think about what, it, what is it that I want to say in this painting? And for this particular painting, it's a somber, sort of quiet, sad moment for this boy. He's just gone down and discovered that his dock was wrecked. Um, but it's also the quiet after the storm. So I wanted to create sort of a quiet, somewhat peaceful scene, but that's also broken up with this idea of his dock being destroyed. So compositionally, I used lines like the horizon line going straight across the painting here and in the foreground um, to create a sort of a, a flat, calm, peaceful moment. And also the round shapes. I don't know if you guys can hear my birds are chirping downstairs. <laughs> They sound pretty excited about this book. I don't know. Um, but they, the clouds and the tree shapes are these soft, rounded shapes. And then I have the shapes of the dock and the pilings, which are coming in at angles and they're sharp and, and sort of out of kilter. And so that's, that's how I'm interrupting this peaceful moment. If the dock and everything wasn't there, it would just look like a nice, peaceful, serene landscape. But these angular shapes really come into play. And then my next step is to do an actual pencil on paper drawing. That's how most of my art starts out, um, drawing pencil on paper. And I will finish the drawing and it'll look something like this. And I bring it into my computer and I will um, paint it using, I use mostly Photoshop uh, to paint the, uh, the, the sort of the colors beneath the drawing. And so in the end, this is what it looks like. I also use, you know, splatters that I make with ink for textures. And sometimes I'll make stains with tea or coffee on paper and I'll integrate those textures into the ground here, you can see, and on the water. Um, and I was very happy with the way this painting came out because it, it, mostly because it did what I wanted it to do from an emotional standpoint. I wanted you to feel what that kid felt when he saw his docs. Um, and when I'm drawing, I usually like to get reference for uh, kids and uh, places and people. So I took a lot of photos for this book. I went back to my old doc and took photos of the neighborhood. Um, but also I, I had a, a friend, a family friend who was about the same age at the time uh, when I experienced this as a kid and he sort of looked a little bit like I did when I was a kid. And so he uh, generously modeled for my main character, which made it a lot easier to uh, draw him the way I wanted to. Um, so you can see here he's climbing the stairs and, and he was a great model. His name's Logan. So that is my book, Hurricane. I hope you enjoy it. Um, it is sort of the, the, uh, the last book, if you will, in uh, a trilogy, uh, which is, I can pull the books up here, starting with Blackout, uh, Blizzard, and now Hurricane. And uh, it's interesting because Blackout came out 10 years ago. Um, Blizzard, I think, came out in 2014. And now finally we have Hurricane. And um, I would love to now open it up to anyone who has questions about my bookmaking or hurricanes or anything you want to talk about. All right. Hi, Hi I'm back. Uh, I see we've got some questions here. This is your time. If you have a question for John Rocco, now is your chance to ask it. Let's see, I'm gonna take a look at these great questions. 
All right. I have a question um, from Daisy. Daisy would like to know if there were a lot of hurricanes when you were growing up in Rhode Island, or was this the only one? I, I remember three hurricanes that I grew up with as a kid. Um, I don't remember which one was which uh, exactly. Um, growing up in Rhode Island, uh, we, we didn't get the brunt of hurricanes that you might get if you were living in Florida or Louisiana or places like that, because a lot of hurricanes tend to sort of um, lose their strength and become tropical storms by the time they come all the way up the coast to Rhode Island. But um, I do remember a few. Uh, I think we're having more now than we've had back you know, 40 years ago when I was a kid. Um, I remember one that I slept the entire night. It was a, a, one of these nighttime hurricanes, you know, that was coming at night. And uh, I slept through it with my window open. Oh no. Uh, <laughs> there were, there were uh, yeah, the screen blew out. There were leaves and, and things that have blown into my room and I slept through it. I, I don't know how I did, but um, I did. And uh, luckily, you know, nothing major ever happened to our family or our house during the hurricane, but I know that they can be quite disastrous. And, you know, I have friends that have dealt with losing their homes and, and you know, having to move away and, um, it, yeah, they, they can be a very dangerous thing, but um, I think we all experience these kind of things differently, you know? Um, and I think you experience things as a child differently than you do as an adult. Um, so I like to speak to that childhood experience of these things in, in my books. So great question, Daisy, thank you. Um, and I also have a question from Sam who wants to know how old you were when you first started drawing. Um, that's an interesting question. I, of course, like all kids, I drew pretty much as soon as I could hold a crayon. Um, but I didn't really take it seriously or, or think about doing it as a living until much later. I was, I was actually, um, I was going to school for engineering and I was living with an illustrator. So I was already in college and I thought, you know, I, I loved what this guy did for a living. He just, you know, he sat in his room and he drank coffee and listened to records and painted pictures and, and would go to the mailbox and get a check. And I thought, this is amazing. I, I want to learn how to do this. And, uh, and so that's what it sort of first introduced me to the idea of, of illustration as a, as a career. And then I, I started drawing more and more and then eventually went to art school to learn how to, to really focus my intention on, on being an illustrator. So uh, I guess the, the short answer is I was about 19 years old when I first started drawing seriously, hmm. which is kind of late for most people <laughs> that I work with, you know, they, they start much younger. So if you're starting now and you're younger than me, then you're, you're, you're doing great. <laughs> keep, go, keep going. And but remember one piece of advice I always give uh, budding artists or, or kids who like to draw is that drawing, drawing is about redrawing redrawing and redrawing like drawing the same thing over and over again because the more you do it the better it'll come out each time uh, you can't expect that first pen to paper or pencil to paper to be a masterpiece it's not going to be it's not for me i draw things over and over and over again and, and that's how each time i draw them they get a little bit better so that's what it takes to to kind of get to the point where you really happy with something. Mm -hmm. Isn't that how it is for so many things in life? Great advice. Yeah. yeah. Are, uh, where do you get your inspiration? Do you have other favorite authors, illustrators um, that have inspired you? Uh, I, I have, a, yes, I have 
tons of other people that inspire me, some that I know and have shared studio space with, um, and some that uh, were creating illustrations back in the early 1900s, like um, N.C. Wyeth and Howard Pyle and, and Maxfield Parrish are some of the turn of the century illustrators back in like uh, 1910s, 1920s that were doing some incredible art for children's books that uh, always inspires me. Um, but then, you know, when I was living in New York City and I was trying to become a children's book illustrator and, and met many people uh, there who actually did it, um, you know, those, those were all great inspirations. I shared a studio uh, with my friend, Brian Floca. You might know some of his books like uh, Moonshot and uh, Keeping the City Going and, and things like that. Um, Locomotive, which he won the Caldecott Medal for. Um, so we shared a studio with several other children's book creators, uh, Sophie Blackall, Sergio Boussier, and Johnny Marciano. And so being around them on a daily basis was always inspiring, you know, watching them create books and, and me working on my own books. And um, I, I love that. I miss that because now I'm in Rhode Island, but we're, we're starting to uh, find, I say we, because my wife's also making books now. Um, and we're starting to find uh, other, other children's book illustrators who we've been hanging out with. And, and so that's really nice because you can talk shop instead of just being in your studio all by yourself. Is your, the space that you're in right at this moment, is this where you also do make your art and work on your book? Yes, this, this is my studio. I mean, I could, my computer's very heavy, I could, but it's kind of a mess right now. But uh, see, this is like my project table that's just covered with whatever. Um, but yeah, this is where I do all my work. It's on the top floor of a, of a 170 year old house. Um, and I come up to the top floor and, and spend my day drawing and writing. And, and in the room next door is my wife's writing studio. So that makes it easy for when we're working on books together. Um, and then downstairs is filled with animals. <laughs> we, have, we have two cats, a dog, three birds, and some fish. So, oh my. yeah, so it's, we don't have any outdoor animals except for the ones that just wander into our yard. And we've had everything from turkeys to foxes and coyotes and, and oh, deer. Cool. Yeah. Well, it's, it's always great. One of the, one of the perks of, of doing these virtual programs is that we get to have a, into the um, spaces where our um, authors work. So very nice. You're living the dream now. Do you, do you listen to music when you write, just like your um, you fantasized about doing when you were younger? Yeah, I do. I listen to music, but a lot of times I'll actually play like movies that I know. Mm -hmm. So movies I've seen before, but I can just listen to the dialogue. Mm -hmm. But I can only do that when I'm when I'm actually doing like final artwork, because the other stuff takes too much of my brain to kind of think about especially writing or, or sketching, you know, sort of designing the book, then it has to be a little bit quieter then, mm -hmm. but yeah. Yeah. T to get back to the book, Daisy has a question. Um, sure. how, how did you know what to do to rebuild the doc? Oh, <laughs> well, when I, when I started trying to rebuild the doc, I had no idea what I was doing. Um, and so, yeah, that was just me kind of like putting together a makeshift sort of, you know, platform to get out over the water. Um, but uh, the, the, the neighborhood that I lived in, they had what they call the Beach Association. And uh, one of the people on that Beach Association was actually a, a carpenter, a friend of mine. Um, he, uh, he, was, he was older than me at the time, but um, I, I 
when I was writing this book, I actually called him up and I said, do you remember when we rebuilt the dock? And so he was able to recall like how we had done it. And, and uh, so that was really helpful. And it was the whole neighborhood, you know, that kind of came together to rebuild it. But, but he was kind of the, the leader on this is how we're going to get it done. Uh, so it was nice to have him to be able to like ask those questions, you know, because I, I don't exactly remember, you know, who did what or why, but um, that, that was really helpful when, when creating this book. His name was Tommy Ramsey. He's a great guy. Excellent. What was your, uh, Katie, Katie G asked, what was your, was your research process for the facts in the back of the book? Oh, so um a, a lot of the research that I did for hurricanes, um, I found out through uh, the NOAA uh, website, N O, oh, let me see, N O A A, I believe it is. They are right um, here in the area. In fact, I live in Silver Spring, and they're okay. Right the so, yeah, so they they have a lot of great information about weather and mm -hmm. and uh, hurricanes and all of that. And the parts of the doc was, um, was, you know, just some research on, on how those docks were built uh, back then. And, and it's, it's very similar to how people build docks today. Um, a lot of times they don't do the same. What we had done was covered the tops of the pilings with fiberglass. Um, and a lot of that is to keep uh, the water from seeping into the top and creating sort of a rot, you know, it'll start to rot after a while. Um, now, a lot of pilings have like cone shaped things like plastic cone shaped things on top. And that I believe the reason they do that is because they don't want seagulls landing and standing on seagulls like to, you know, land on pilings and things like that and, and leave behind, you know, what seagulls leave behind on a dock, <laughs> not, not just poop, but like broken crab shells and everything that they have to like smash open to eat. So it keeps the dock cleaner if the seagulls go find another place to sit. I, I don't mind it myself. It's fun to see what they brought up out of the, out of the sea. Right, right. Um, let's see. Um... Was there, Daisy asked, was there anything that was challenging or new when doing drawing for Hurricane compared to your other books? Um, you know, every, every book's a different kind of challenge. I think for this one, um, this is the first time I had done, a, created a lot of scenes on the water. So I think uh, figuring out how I wanted to paint the water and the reflections and the, you know things like that because uh, I hadn't really done that before. So, uh, for instance, just you know figuring out the the sparkles on the on the water that you know depending on where the sun is when you're when you're looking at the water, um, it can look many different ways, right? And and the the water color is usually because of the reflection of the sky. Uh, and so depending on the weather and what's happening in the time of day, the water can look very, very different. So you see, you know, in this painting, the water looks a certain way, but uh, when he discovers his dock here, the water looks very different. And you can see it's very much like the color of the sky. So thinking about that, thinking about how I was going to portray the river uh, was, was a particular challenge. Yeah. Good questions, Daisy. Thank you. Do you have a, um, a favorite image or spread in the book? Um, I, you know, I like the cover a lot. I think that's one of my favorite favorite paintings. Um, just just because it it kind of says a lot, you know. Just in one image, you sort of see 
the people back here somewhat worried. He's, he's looking at the title, which is Hurricane, um, and uh, you're kind of worried about him. It, it, it got across what I wanted to do with the cover. Um, I also, I really liked this spread a lot, mm -hmm. sort of dream spread because- That's my favorite. As a kid, you know, there were times when, when big, big schools of fish would, would come up the river for some reason that we didn't know, uh, either to spawn or, or whatever. Um, so there were moments on that river where, you know, like really exciting things were happening. You know, fish, big fish would be just flying up the river, thousands of them. And we didn't know why. And, and I always remember that, you know, this river is connected to the ocean. So the idea that anything could come up the river. Um, and I remember a story from my childhood when a whale actually came up, not this river, but the Providence River, uh, a, a whale had come into the bay and gone up into the Providence River and like everyone had to kind of work together to kind of get it back out to the sea. And I thought, you know, wow, there's no reason anything can't just come right up underneath my dock. You know, and that was my thinking as a, as a child, you know. So when I put my line in the water, I could have caught anything. Yeah. Wow, that, that sounds like a great story for a book, too, that the whale that uh, came up yeah. and had to be turned around. Yeah. All right. Well, on that note, one last question. Do you have any new projects that you're working on that you want to share, or is it all top secret? Um, no, well, it's, you know, <laughs> um, depends on uh, what top secret means these <laughs> days. But uh, I, I am, I just finished a book uh, with, with my wife, uh, Haley Rocco, who wrote it, um, and it's called How to Send a Hug, and it comes out next fall, and it's about uh, sending letters and the importance of, of that old-fashioned way of communication and, and how it affects people when they receive a letter. Um, my wife was a, a, a great, she's a great letter writer. She writes letters all the time, uh, and it's it's sort of a lost art, you know. But um, she found herself writing a lot more letters during during this last year and a half, uh, and really, we connected to that idea and said, "Yo, we got to make a book about this." Um, so we have this book coming out in a, a probably less than a year um, called "How to Send a Hug." And I am working on another book with another friend of mine uh, about uh, the African-American contributions to the space program and that, how it impacted the civil rights movement. And that's uh, more of a middle grade uh, mm. project that will probably come out in about two years. That's a bigger project that's taking a, a longer <laughs> bit of time. But yeah, I'm always working on at least a couple of books simultaneously. And then, and then I have other ideas that are, you know, ready to go down the road. And, and sometimes I get asked to illustrate someone else's book. And so, yeah, I mean, it's not, as long as I can keep doing it, I'll keep doing it. I love it. And uh, it's a lot of fun to talk about, you know, creating these books and what goes into them. So. Well, it's a lot of fun to hear about. So we so appreciate you joining us today. And thank you, viewers, for those great- Thank you. Yes, you thank, thank, sorry. Thank you, what? Brandy. And thank you to Politics and Prose for hosting me. Absolutely. It's our pleasure. So just a reminder to our guests, it's not too late for you to click on the link in the chat to purchase your copy of Hurricane or come visit us in the store. We'll, we'll show it to you in person. Um, and you can learn about other upcoming events in the Children and Teens Department on our website, which is politics-pros.com. Uh, if you click on the Children and Teens tab and then click events, you can see a calendar of all of our upcoming events. And you can also view past events on our YouTube channel. All right. 
Thank you again, John. Thanks everyone for joining us. We've had a great time today. Everybody have an awesome day. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Bye-bye.